Our first reading is from Psalm 146, verse 7 to 9. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The second reading is from Mark 14, verses 53 to 65. They took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself by the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. He heard him say, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands and in three days will build another not made with with hands. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. When the high priest stood up before them and, and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? And Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the priest asked him, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do you need any more witnesses, he asked. You've heard the blasphemy, what do you think? They all condemned condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. Our first object is a blindfold. And I have some, some strips of cloth to represent a blindfold. And if you would like to take one and hold it as I read the reflection and uh, start in some prayers, please do come and find one. Captives are often blindfolded, not just to ensure that they can't see where they are going, but to dehumanize, diminish, and demean the victim. By covering the eyes, you can reduce the human being to a thing. They also have a belief that the eyes are the window to the soul. It can be a disarming, disturbing thing to look deeply into someone's eyes and see their emotional response. It's not a surprise that the chief priests, the elders and the teachers of the law decided to cover up the eyes of the man they had condemned as worthy of death. There is a painful irony in the story here. Jesus, who opened his ministry by declaring in the synagogue that he had come to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of the sight for the blind, and to set the oppressed free, is captured, blind, afflicted. This trial before the religious authorities has a pretense of justice and proper process, but they are unable to find any evidence against Jesus, and he remains silent and gives them no reason to convict him. Finally, the high priest asked Jesus, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? In the face of the truth, not a trumped up charge against him, Jesus can no longer be silent. I am, he says, and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus speaks the truth, but it is too much for the high priest. He tears his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? 
the eyes of the religious authorities are closed to who Jesus really is. They refuse to recognize that he is the Messiah, God with us, the Son of God. Overcome with anger and fear, they respond by blindfolding him, beating him, spitting on him. As we hold this blindfold, we remember that Jesus' commission from God is to open the eyes of the blind. In the Gospel accounts, we see Jesus bringing restored sight to the physically blind. Perhaps we think of Bartimaeus. But we also know that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This remains Jesus' challenge to us today, to open our eyes and walk in his light of life. So perhaps as we sit here in reflection, we might ask ourselves, are our eyes open to see Jesus as the true Messiah, God with us, the Son of God? Are we too standing with Jesus, the light of the world, to bring the light of life to all who are walking in darkness. I'm just going to say a prayer that you might want to echo in your own hearts. Light of the world, you can never be hidden, smothered or diminished. Though the soldiers covered your eyes, you shine through in truth and justice in our deepest humanity. Give us courage never to be silenced by fear, never to go along with the crowd, but to find you in the eyes of those we encounter. Help us to recognize you as the I am and acknowledge you as our King. Jesus is mocked. Our first reading is Psalm 25, 19 to 21. See how numerous are my enemies, and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope, Lord, is in you. And now in Mark chapter 15, verses 1 20. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews, asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to get Pilate to release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder. Crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. 
and they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. I invite you to come and take some thorns, but I would warn you that they are very sharp, so please take care when you take them out of the basket. The religious authorities handed Jesus over to the Roman governor, Pilate, and it's obvious from the beginning that Pilate is reluctant to convict Jesus. He urges Jesus to speak up and defend himself against the accusations from the chief priests. Jesus remains silent. Pilate repeatedly refers to Jesus as the king of the Jews and seems to want to find ways to release him. But the crowd continue to cry out for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be crucified. Finally, Pilate despairingly says, why? What evil has he done? But he doesn't stand his ground. Instead, he gives in to the angry crowd, releasing a known terrorist and sending an innocent man to be crucified. The soldiers lead Jesus away, and we see them play out a shocking charade of homage to a king. Putting a purple robe on his back and a crown of thorns on his head, they call out, Hail! King of the Jews, Jesus remains silent. They fall on their knees and ridicule him with bogus worship. Jesus remains silent. They strike him on the head and spit on him. Jesus remains silent. This is not the treatment that is due to a king. But this is not the response expected from a king. Jesus never claimed to be a human king, but throughout his life he showed us what it really means to be the king of all humanity. He turned our picture of kingly power, authority and control on its head. He chose to spend time, not with those who had power, wealth, and influence, but with the poor, the excluded, the powerless. As we reflected last Sunday, Palm Sunday, he entered Jerusalem not in the grand victory parade of a conquering king, but humbly seated on a lowly donkey. He shocked his disciples by bending down to wash their feet and showing that true leadership in his kingdom is seen in service, meekness, and humility. As we hold these mocking thorns, let's reflect on our own understanding of power and control. Are we really willing to be part of God's kingdom of humility, mercy, and surrender? Or are we still holding on to control seeing ourselves as the center of the world. Are we willing to accept Jesus' invitation to kneel with him and simply serve? Servant King, you challenge our assumptions and power structures. You invite us to belong to your peaceable kingdom where swords will be beaten into plows, spears into pruning hooks. Help us to cast down our pride and raise up in our truest selves, raise us up in our truest selves, that we may kneel and serve with you. Amen. Soldiers draw lots. Psalm 46, verses 1 to 3. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, 
Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. And Mark 15, verses 21 to 24. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. They crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. Our next object is dice, and I have some very tiny dice beads for you to come and, and take if you would like to. There's a real matter of factness about this passage in Mark. The cruel reality of the journey from the Roman palace to the hill called Golgotha, that so many thousand condemned prisoners had taken before Jesus. Jesus struggles to carry the heavy cross and a random stranger is plucked from the crowd and called on to carry the cross. Like so many before Jesus facing the agonizing trial of death by crucifixion, Jesus is offered wine mixed with myrrh that could perhaps help to dull the physical pain he will experience. Jesus refuses the offer. The act of crucifixion is described so simply in this version in Mark, and they crucified him. Then we get this detail about the soldiers dividing up his clothes and casting lots to see what, what each would get. Although the soldiers are not aware of it, this casting of lots for Jesus' clothes was a fulfillment of David's prophecy in Psalm 22. In verse 18 we read, They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So much of the journey that Jesus took from his entry into Jerusalem and up to this point seems very random and unexpected. And yet Jesus knew that so much of the minute detail had been foretold in the Hebrew scriptures. It is only after his resurrection that Jesus opens the eyes of his followers to see that everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Sometimes our life feels full of chances and random events that don't quite go the way we're expecting. The soldiers must have used their dice many times. Casting lots for the clothing from their crucified prisoners could be seen as an extra perk for a very unpleasant job. A quick gamble for some entertainment, a chance for luck to go their way. As Simon was grabbed out of the crowd by chance to help with Jesus' cross, as the soldiers cast their lots, you could say that they were either lucky or unlucky. But beneath this freedom of random chance, there is a deeper intention and purpose for our lives and our universe held by God. Jesus knew that the path he was taking to the cross his death and ultimately his rising from his grave was the fulfillment of God's will. As we hold our dice, let's reflect on our own response to difficult and unexpected turns in our lives. Do we really believe that God has a plan and a purpose for our lives and longs for each of us to thrive in his care? Do we recognize that through our trust and faith in Jesus, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in times of trouble? I'm going to pray a prayer from the Compline service, something that's usually said just before bedtime. 
Be present, O merciful God, and protect us through the silent hours of this night, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of this fleeting world may repose upon thy eternal changelessness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The reading is from Psalm 22, verses 1 and 2, and 7 and 8, and then from Mark 15, verses 25 to 32. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who were going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. So we come to the nails, and I have some nails if you'd like to take one of these. He could have said no, but he didn't. He said yes, and he chose the nails. Nails that would be hammered through his hands, through his feet, holding this innocent man to the cross. Nails hammered through skin muscle, tendons and ligaments, and finally through bone. Every hammer is for you and for me because he chose the nails. He didn't have to. He could have said no, but he didn't. He said yes, and he chose the nails. Jesus dies. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. 
I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue stocks, sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma lap sabathani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with white vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women had also come up with him to Jerusalem, were also there. It was preparation day that is, the day before the Sabbath. So, as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked him for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph brought him some, some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. The cup. I have small cups of water mixed with vinegar, a bitter cup. I'm not going to stand here and hand them out, but I'm just going to invite you when we get to the moment of prayer that you might want to come and take one and hold it, and particularly remembering people who you know who are currently facing bitterness, hardness, difficulties in their lives, that we might pray for them. So I'll invite you after my reflection. Last night in our Monday Thursday service, we remembered Jesus going to the garden in Gethsemane, inviting his disciples to sit with him as he prayed. He took Peter, James and John along with him and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed 
that if it was possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. We still use this phrase, drinking the cup we've been given, sometimes drinking a bitter cup. This cup is there as a picture of suffering, bitterness and pain that Jesus is enduring. The cup that Jesus had to drink was a symbol of the suffering and death that he had to go through. In the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus struggled with the path that lay ahead of him, but still he surrendered to God's will. His death was the only way to bring life to all humanity. At the ninth hour on the cross, Jesus cried out the most human and heartfelt cry of desolation. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus has come to the end of his human resources. He's exhausted, empty, feels abandoned by God. Perhaps we've sometimes wrongly pictured Jesus as some sort of superhuman as if his relationship with God insulates him from the reality of suffering. It couldn't be further from the truth. Just like us, we see Jesus feeling doubts and fears, temptations and needs. In John's gospel account of this particular moment in the crucifixion story, we hear that Jesus says, I am thirsty. Another fulfillment of Hebrew scripture. And one of the bystanders uses a sponge on the end of a stick to quench his parched mouth with a bitter mix of water and vinegar. But because his mouth is moistened, he is able to make his final cry, it is finished. In Jesus' death, we see the start of the promise he made to quench the thirst of every thirsty person. In his resurrection to come, we see the fulfillment of his promise that whoever believes in me shall never thirst. It's a promise that's also completed in the last book of the Bible. In Revelation 7, we read that those who put their trust in Jesus as their saviour shall neither hunger nor thirst any more. In the journey through Holy Week, we're sitting in the in-between time Jesus has surrendered to death. His body has been taken down from the cross. His disciples and followers are grieving, full of disappointment, feeling let down. Things have not turned out as they expected. And yet we sit on the other side of the story. We know there is dawn to come and everything will change. As we reflect on this bitter cup of water and vinegar, that represents the suffering that Jesus went through. We remember that Jesus promised that whoever believes in him will receive a living water springing up to eternal life. Death has been defeated and life is restored to all who will believe in him. So I invite you, if you would like to, to come up and take one of the cups And bring before God those you know who are drinking from a bitter cup right now, suffering pain, hurt and loss. And ask that God might show them the way to the thirst-quenching refreshment that can only come from Jesus. But you also might like to pray for yourself as we approach Easter Day, that you will hold on to Jesus' promise that no one who comes to him will ever be thirsty and that we will be again filled with his living water that springs up to eternal life in each one of us.